we're into the combat phase. Starting with the first player, you'll take turns activating units and attacking each other. At this point, we'll just re-familiarise ourselves with weapon cards. These will have all the info you need, but it's worth taking a look at the traits on page 38 and 39. There are 19 of these, and we won't be covering them all here. Each weapon will have an arc your target will need to be inside to attack. Front arc at 90 degrees, a 360 degree arc, and a corridor. And finally, before we get into it, a quick word on modifiers. When rolling to hit your target, you'll roll a d6, and you'll need to score your ballistic skill value, or more, usually a 3+. Plus. Modifiers will affect this roll, such as range, denoted on weapon cards, and cover. A target, at least 25% obscured, will apply a minus 1 to your hit roll, and a target, 50% obscured, will apply a minus 2 modifier. But remember, a roll of 1 will always miss, and a roll of 6 will always hit. So how does combat work? By following the combat phase sequence, in this video we will take you through some examples of combat. Attacks versus void shields, attacks versus armour, and attacking at close quarters. In order to damage Titans in games of Adeptus Titanicus, you will either need to get through their void shields or get within them, and we'll cover that later. To drop void shields, you'll need to have attacks strength 4 or more using the impregnable barrier rule. Anything strength 3 or less is just not strong enough. In our example here, we have a loyalist reaver at the bottom of the screen and its terminal on the left, and a traitor reaver at the top of the screen with its terminal on the right. The traitor reaver is the first player and will be selected to attack first. The traitor reaver then selects the loyalist reaver as its target, then chooses the gatling blaster to start attacking with, as this is a good void stripper. We then check range, arc and line of sight, noting that this is not in the weapon's short range, so there's no bonus to hit. We then make the attack with 6 dice, with a ballistic skill of 3 plus, scoring 4 hits. The Loyalist Reaver now has to make void shield saves, looking at the void track requiring 3 plus. There are 4 hits, so we roll 4 dice, making 2 saves and dropping 2 voids. The Traitor Reaver then selects its next weapon to attack with. Bear in mind that you must fire all your weapons at the same target, unless you have split fire orders, which we'll explain in a later video. The Reaver player then selects the Turbo Laser Destructor on the carapace. We can check the arc, range and line of sight as usual, but take note the Turbo Laser Destructor has a trait called Shield Bane, which will reduce the Void Shield save of your opponent by one, but in order to do this, it has draining, which means you'll have to push the reactor. We roll the reactor dice and get two heat. We then roll our attacks, which is two dice, scoring two hits on a three plus. The Loyalist Reaver must now make two void shield saves. Looking at the track requires a four plus, but with the shield bane, now needs five plus. The Loyalist Reaver elects to use voids to full, which is at the bottom of page 34. By pushing its reactor, it can re-roll any void shield save of a 1. The reactor is pushed by rolling the die and scores 1 heat. Then it rolls its saves and scores a 1 and a 4, which is 2 fails, but can re-roll the 1. Does so and scores a 5, now dropping only 1 void shield. This leaves the loyalist void shield track on its last void. The Traitor Reaver only has a Chain Fist left, which is no good in this fight, and its round of shooting ends. The Loyalist Reaver now activates, selects the Traitor Reaver as its target, then selects the missiles on the carapace to fire. We now check line of sight, arc and range, and then had 5 attack dice rolling to hit, needing a 3+. plus. We score 5 hits. The Traitor Reaver now needs to make void saves and decides to push the reactor for voids to fall straight away, rolling the reactor dice and scoring one heat. With five hits it rolls five saves, needing a three plus and re-rolling ones at this point. It only makes two saves, and no re-rolls, losing three void shields. The Loyalist Reaver then chooses its next weapon, the Laser Blaster. We check line of sight, arc and range again, and in doing so we notice that it is in short range and doesn't have the minus one effect that it would do at long range. This weapon also has the shield bane and draining trait, 
which this reverb will use. It pushes the reactor and rolls two heat. We then roll the attack dice, which is three, scoring two hits using the ballistic skill of three plus. The traitor reaver then has to make its void saves. It decides to use voids to full again, pushing the reactor and rolling one more heat. It can now re-roll ones on failed saves. The void shield track is telling us we need a four plus to save, but with shield bane in effect, we're gonna need a five plus. We roll two saves, make one and fail one, but we can re-roll the one. We re-roll the save and we fail again. Voids are now blown. With shields down, the Loyalist Reaver can now fire its Volcano Cannon and start doing damage to this Titan. But we're going to stop here and we'll save that for the next part of the video. Attacks versus Armour. In Adeptus Titanicus, there are so many different weapon types, traits, modifiers, etc. That there are limitless combinations that will lead to a Titan's demise. In this section of the video, we will look at some of those combinations as examples of taking damage against armour, and ultimately, a Titan death. In the previous example, Attacks versus Void Shields, we followed the combat sequence. When attacking versus armour, you'll follow the same sequence, except there are no Void Shield saves. Instead, you'll be doing damage to the Titan itself, with armour rolls, and this is what we'll focus on now. In our first example, let's look at how an armour roll is made. In the top left, we have our Loyalist Reaver. This will be our attacker. And in front of it is our Traitor Reaver as the target. The terminal on the right corresponds to the Traitor Reaver, and you can see its void shields have been blown. The attacking Reaver has gone through the combat sequence, attacking with its laser blaster, and has hit three times. With no void shields to protect itself, the Traitor Reaver will now have damage taken against its armor. To do this, first roll the location dice. This has head, leg, arms, body, and special. Don't worry about special for now, that'll be something for later Titans. If you roll the special, count it as the body. In this example, the body has been rolled. If you roll a location you can't see, for example the legs when they're behind cover, re-roll the dice until you roll a location that you can see. With the location rolled, all hit dice will hit that area, which is three hits. We roll all three hit dice, and then add the strength of the weapon to see what we get. We roll a 1, a 3 and a 5. Starting with the lowest number, a 1 is always a superficial hit, regardless of the strength of the weapon, and bounces off. A 3 plus 8 is 11, a direct hit, and we move the track by 1. A 5 plus 8 is a 13, a devastating hit, and we move the track by 2. And with the armour roll complete for that weapon, you would move on to the next weapon and repeat the process if you had any left to fire. In this example, we're going to look at modifiers, critical hits, critical damage. The Loyalist Reaver is attacking again with its laser blaster and scores two hits this time. It rolls a location dice and rolls the body again. As you can see, the Traitor Reaver has already taken damage on its tracks. This time, when a Loyal Reaver rolls against the body, it has a plus one modifier to add to the armor roll. This bonus applies to all the armor roll dice, in this case, two. Other modifiers can include attacks in the side arc for a further plus one and attacks in the rear arc for a further plus two. The Loyal Reaver makes its armor roll, rolling a one and a six. The one is superficial and has no effect, but the six plus strength eight plus one for the modifier equals 15, now a critical hit. The Traitor Reaver now takes a point of critical damage, then increases the damage track by two. Let's now look at an example of targeted attacks. Further critical damage and catastrophic damage. Titan death. Our trusty Law Reaver attacks with its laser blaster and wants to finish off the Tracer Reaver. The Law Reaver elects to make a targeted attack. This confers a minus two penalty to hit, taking our Blizzard Skill 3 to Blizzard Skill 5 plus. Luckily it scores three hits. If there are any extra modifiers to hit requiring a 7 or more, such as cover, you cannot make a targeted attack, but can still attack normally. So because our hits were targeted, the Law Reaver can select a location instead of rolling for it. Seeing the leg track is full, selects the leg and goes for the kill, rolling all three hit dice, adding the strength of 8 and a plus 3 modifier at this point. The Law Reaver scores a 2, 
a 3 and a 5. The 2 plus 8 plus 3 equals 13, a devastating hit. Because the track is full, any extra damage that overspills turns into critical damage. The 3 plus 8 plus 3 equals 14, another devastating hit. Again, the track is full and turns into critical damage. And finally, the 5 plus 8 plus 3 equals 16, a critical hit. The Traitor Reaver takes critical damage as usual. Then the two structure points overspill again and creates another critical damage. When a Titan runs out of a critical damage track, you roll a d10 on the catastrophic damage table on page 36. You have plus one to the result if your reactor is in the orange and plus three to the result if your reactor is in the red and the Titan is destroyed. At this point, it's customary to your engine kill over the table and have a blast on your warhorn. Just a final word on critical damage effects. As your Titans receive critical damage, it is important you check the effects on page 35. Some are instantaneous, like VSG burnout, and some take effect in the end phase, such as reactor leaks. Our last example for the combat phase is close quarters and smash attacks. Close quarters is when you attack a unit within two inches of its base. This is important for three reasons. If the unit you're attacking has void shields, they won't help here. Any attack within two inches are inside void shields and attack against armor straight away. Targeted attacks only suffer a minus one to hit modifier rather than minus two. And lastly, this is when you switch and use the Titan's weapon skill value to hit instead of ballistic skill. And that's it. So to finish off, let's look at a close quarters fight using a smash attack on page 36. And what happens when you hit a weapon location? Here we see our protagonists in one final battle. Our loyal reaver on the left and our traitor on the right. The loyalist is the first player and attacks using the combat sequence. You'll notice both titans have full voids, but as they are in close quarters range, neither titan can benefit from void shields. The loyal titan elects to use a smash attack. This is a special attack used in the combat phase or after a charge, but again, we'll cover that in a later video. A smash attack has a profile on page 36 and uses a titan's front arc and has a short range of 1 inch. Smash attacks have a random attack value of d3. This means you roll a d6, half the result and round it up. The loyalist reaver rolls to see how many attacks it gets and rolls a 5. This equals 3 attacks, then rolls to hit, remembering at close quarters we use the weapon skill characteristic and scores 2 hits. You'll notice smash attacks have the melee trait, page 39. This trait enables you to choose the location rather than rolling the location dice. An attack made without the melee trait would have a minus one to hit modifier at close quarters range for targeted attacks. Attacks made normally would roll the location dice as normal. The Loyalist Reaver targets the Traitor Chainfist weapon location and rolls the two damage dice from the hits, and rolls a two and a five. The strength of a smash attack is scale plus one. The bigger the Titan, the bigger the smash. Our Reaver is scale eight and scores two plus eight plus one, getting 11. And then a five, plus eight, plus one, for 14. We now see the 11 beats the 10 plus required to disable the weapon, and the card is flipped over and can no longer be used until it is repaired. Notice the 14 is also enough, but now any further successful damage rolls are discarded and the attack is complete. Let's see what happens when a disabled location is hit by a fresh attack. Remember, a smash attack is an additional attack at this range, and Titans are free to unleash all the other weapons in its arsenal. With this in mind, the Loyalist Reaver attacks with the Gatling Blaster. A normal attack, not targeted, using the weapon skill characteristic at close quarters, and a plus one to hit modifier at close range. Six attacks are rolled, requiring a three plus to hit, and scores four hits. The location dice is rolled, and comes up with a weapon. Who'd have thought it? Because a reaver has three weapon locations, we allocate a number to each and roll a d3 to see which one takes the hits. A one is rolled and surprise surprise, it hits the chain fist. With four hits, we now roll four damage rolls, scoring a two, three, five, and six, and add the weapon strength of five. Two and five is seven, 
3 and 5 is 8, 5 and 5 is 10, and 6 and 5 is 11. So what does this do to an already disabled weapon? At the bottom of the card there are detonation scores. Any damage rolls that are equal or beat those scores will then do damage at the strength in brackets plus d6 to the body. So our reaver damage rolls were 7 and 8, which are not enough, and 10 and 11, which now do strength 7 detonations to the body. We roll two dice and score a three and a six, adding the strength seven for a 10 and 13 result. A direct and devastating hit, and we move the tracks like so. So we've come to the end of our examples, and there's quite a lot to take in. We've done examples of all the main mechanics of the combat phase, but of course there's still a lot of traits that you can use for your weapons. Check them out, take your time, and just enjoy it. And I'll catch up with you in the next video, the end phase.